All right, let's dive into some Java today. We're going to be looking at data types. Specifically, um, we've got some excerpts here from, let's see, we've got Java Point, some W3 Schools, even a little Code Academy sprinkled in. Nice. Yeah, I figured, you know, we all know a little something about data types already, but uh, let's see if we can level up our intuition here. Yeah, absolutely. Data types are really interesting because they're kind of like the foundation of how the language understands information. For sure. So it's not just about like memorizing rules. It's it's more like if you understand this deeply, then you can really, um, I think, become more fluent in the language itself. Right. Like actually understanding the grammar behind it. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So Java Point, they they call data types the building blocks of data manipulation. Yeah. That's a good way to put it because yeah. it really is like you're you're constructing something, right? You need the right materials for the job. Yeah. Like you wouldn't use a, uh, I don't know, a teaspoon to measure out flour for cake. You'd use a measuring cup, right? Right. The right tool for the job. Exactly. And that's what data types are all about. Each one is designed to handle a specific kind of data, and using the right one makes your code more efficient, accurate, all that good stuff. Yeah, and if you choose the wrong one, I imagine that's like trying to use that teaspoon for the flour. It's messy. It doesn't work well, right? 100%, yeah. And and just like there's different tools for different baking tasks. Java gives us different um, you know categories of data types. We've got our primitives. We've got our non-primitives. Right, and Java Point, they made that distinction pretty clear. Could you uh, remind me why that matters? Why do we care about primitives versus non-primitives? Yeah, absolutely. So primitives, those are your bare bones data types. Mm -hmm. Think like numbers, single characters, true or false values, kind of the bedrock, you know. Mm -hmm. Non-primitives, those are your more complex structures like classes, interfaces, and array stuff we'll get into later. But it's important to remember that even those fancy structures they're all built on top of those primitives. Okay, so it's like the primitives are like the atoms of the Java universe. Exactly, exactly. And then everything else is built with them. So we've got our eight primitive types. Boolean, byte, char, short, int, long, float, and double. That's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. But honestly, they're not as scary as they sound. They really are all about storing different kinds of information efficiently. Okay. Take, for instance, int and long. So those are both for storing whole numbers, right? But long, that one's for those supermassive numbers. You know, like if you were writing a program to track astronomical distances or maybe like a simulation with just huge, huge numbers. Okay, so like way bigger than we would use in like everyday life kind of numbers. Way bigger. In, in fact, did you know that a long can store a number larger than the estimated number of atoms in the observable universe? Hold on. Seriously. That's that's wild. I'm kind of starting to see why understanding these little differences really matters, though. Yeah. Like, it's not just theoretical, right? Oh, absolutely not. It can have a real impact on your programs. Like, imagine you're making a game and you're using an int to track the player's score. Everything's going fine. But then somebody racks up this crazy high score, goes way beyond what an int can handle, and boom, game crashes. Players are not happy. Yeah, not a good look. So picking the right data type from the start. That can actually help us prevent bugs down the line. Big time. It's all about writing code that's that's robust, that's reliable. And yeah, when it comes to something like choosing between an in and a, a long, a lot of times it boils down to memory usage, right? Like how much space are you using up versus the size of the numbers you actually need to work with. Right. Got to be efficient. So it's really about choosing the right tool for the job. Speaking of which, what happens when we need to actually switch between these data types in the middle of our code? Like if we start with one, but then we need to use it as a different type later on. Is that a thing? Oh, totally a thing. That's called type conversion. And yeah, it can get a little uh, it can get a little tricky sometimes. But luckily, Java has some mechanisms to help us out with that. Oh, OK. So Java's got our back at least a little bit. At least a little bit. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm definitely intrigued. Let's uh, let's hear more about that. So Java actually tries to help us out here with something called uh, widening conversion. Widening conversion? Is that like, I don't know, stretching a data type to fit more information in it or something? I like that. That's a good way to think about it. Yeah, so widening conversion is basically when you go from a what they call a smaller data type to a larger one. Okay. Like going from an int, which we talked about, to a long Java can handle that automatically because it's a safe conversion. You're not going to lose any information. It's kind of like, you know, pouring your cup of coffee into a bigger thermos. Yeah. It all fits. No problem. Right. Right. No spills. Exactly. 
But then there's the other way around. What happens when you need to go from a larger type to a smaller one? Yeah, that's got to be trickier, like trying to cram all that thermos worth of coffee back into the tiny cup. Exactly. You're going to have a mess. Yeah. Right. And that's where things get a little more uh, delicate. That's called narrowing conversion, and that's where Java gets a little nervous. Nervous? Like, what, is it going to warn me or something? Well, it's going to force you to be explicit about it. Yeah. yeah. You have to use something called casting. Casting. Yeah, you're basically telling Java, hey, I know this looks kind of risky, but just trust me on this one. I'm a professional. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but, of course, as you can imagine, if you're not careful, things can go wrong with narrowing conversions. You know, imagine you're building some kind of financial app, and you try to, like, squeeze a double which might be representing a really large monetary value into an int. Mm -hmm. You might end up losing those cents after the decimal point, and suddenly you're in trouble. Yikes. Yeah. Talk about unhappy customers. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, I'm definitely starting to see how important it is to choose those data types carefully from the beginning. 100%, yeah. It's all about being mindful, especially when you're working with large data sets, sensitive information, things like that. Now, we've been talking a lot about numbers, right? But what about text? Java Point mentioned that char data type for storing single characters. Right, right. Char, that's for when just one letter or symbol will do the trick. Mm -hmm. Though they did point out that Java uses Unicode for characters, not ASCII, like some older languages. Ah, yeah, and that's a really important distinction. See, ASCII, that's pretty limited. It can only handle, like, a couple hundred characters, mostly just your basic English letters, numbers, punctuation, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Unicode, on the other hand, that's like the superhero of character encoding. It can handle characters from almost every writing system on the planet. Oh, wow. So Java's ready for anything, emojis, all that. Bring on the emojis. Chinese characters, Cyrillic script, you name it. Java can handle it. That's really cool. And it's all thanks to this charred data type that can tap into all that. Exactly. It's like having a tiny key that unlocks this massive library of characters from all over the world. I like that. So we've got our char for single characters, but then we've also got, well, what about just true or false? What about the Boolean type? Ah, yes. The Boolean symbol, yet powerful. It seems so basic, though, right? Just true or false. I know, right? Yeah. But it's actually the foundation for so much of what we do in programming. Without Booleans, our programs would be clueless about making decisions. So they're kind of like the, I don't know, the traffic signals of our code directing the flow. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Every time you write an if statement, a loop, anything like that, you're relying on Booleans to evaluate conditions and make decisions. Okay. So even though they seem simple, they're actually super important. Now, there's one more thing I wanted to touch on. Codecademy. They mentioned needing to convert between strings and numeric types using methods like parsint and dotto string. Well, What's that all about? Why do we have to go through those hoops? Right. So that all comes down to how Java handles user input. You see, when a user types something into our program, Java initially sees it as a string, just a bunch of characters strung together. Even if they type in a number. Even then. It's just a string of digits to Java, at least at first. So we need a way to tell Java, hey, this string... I actually want to treat it as a number now. That's where those conversion methods come in. So it's like having two different dictionaries, one for words and one for numbers. Yeah, exactly. And we need a way to translate between them, depending on how we want to use the data. And that's also where the scanner class comes in. The scanner class? What's that? It's like Java's built-in interpreter. It takes what the user types in, which, again, starts as a string, huh. and helps us convert it into the actual data type that our program needs. Okay, so it helps us make sense of what the user is trying to tell us in a way that Java can understand. Exactly. And yeah. that is super important for building interactive programs. Because users, well, they like to type in all sorts of things. That's for sure. So we've got all these different data types, each with their own quirks and uses. We have to choose them carefully and sometimes even convert between them. But what about those non-primitive types we mentioned earlier? Classes, interfaces, arrays, those still sound a bit mysterious. Yeah, those are definitely more advanced. We won't get into all the details today, but it's good to remember that even those fancy structures, they're all built upon the foundation of these primitive types we've been talking about. So they're like what? The skyscrapers of the Java world? Impressive, complex, but ultimately still standing on a foundation of simpler building blocks. 100%, yeah. And understanding those fundamental building blocks, that's what's going to give you a deeper appreciation for how those more complex things work. It's like learning the alphabet before you try to write a novel, right? <laughs> you got to have that solid foundation. Exactly, exactly.
So we've covered a lot of ground here. We talked about the simple, Boolean, the mighty long, even touched on those more mysterious, non-primitive types. But I'm curious, is there anything else about these data types that might surprise someone like me, someone who thinks they've got a decent grasp on the basics? Well, you'd be surprised how often even experienced programmers, they kind of underestimate the performance implications of their data type choices. Oh, you mean like how choosing a long when an int would have been fine could end up using way more memory than you really need? Exactly. And it might not seem like a big deal when you're just putting together a small program. But imagine you're building some massive application, right? We're talking millions of lines of code, gigabytes of data, that kind of thing. Suddenly, those seemingly small choices about data types, they can really impact your program's speed and efficiency. So it's like the difference between, I don't know, running a 5K and a marathon. You can get away with less than ideal gear for a short run, but for a marathon, every little thing counts. 100%, yeah. And just like a marathon runner, wouldn't wear a weighted vest unless they absolutely had to. A good programmer, they're not going to use a data type that takes up more memory than necessary. Makes sense. Are there any like tools or techniques that programmers use to make sure they're making those efficient data type choices? Because, I mean, it's one thing to know the theory, but putting it into practice, that's a whole other thing. Oh, for sure. And that's where things get really interesting. There are these tools called profilers. They can actually analyze your code and point out areas where you might be using more memory than you need to. It's like having a personal trainer for your code, you know. They help you identify areas where you can slim things down, optimize performance, all that good stuff. So it's not all just intuition. There are tools that can help us make those decisions more objectively. Exactly, exactly. And of course, as you gain more experience, you'll start to develop more of an intuitive sense for which data types make the most sense in different situations. It's kind of like learning a musical instrument. Yeah. Right? First, you're thinking about every note, every finger placement, but over time, it becomes second nature. That's a great analogy. So it's not just memorizing the rules. It's understanding how they work in practice, how to really use them. Exactly. And that's what's so cool about programming, right? It's a constant journey of learning, experimenting, figuring things out as you go. Well, this deep dive has definitely opened my eyes to just how much goes into those data type decisions in Java. They're not just some abstract concept. They really are the building blocks of efficient and reliable code. They really are. So to wrap things up, I guess the main takeaway here is to choose your data types wisely. Think about the long game, use the tools available, and don't be afraid to experiment and learn as you go. Couldn't have said it better myself. And with that, we'll wrap up another deep dive. Thanks for listening, everyone.